before we maybe talk a little bit about use cases and, and who's successful of Kafka, um, how you know, the viewers maybe understand a little bit of the technology and, and your design yeah. decisions around yeah. that, right? So yeah. you're one of the you're one of the early um, users of Zookeeper, right? Yeah. So what was the, the thinking of coming up with the design and maybe what's the learning? Where did you guys do some major refactoring and yep. where do you stand right now from like a scale and build yep. out perspective? And then maybe yep. let's talk about some some companies and how they're using yep. it and what absolutely. the value is. Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, that's a great question. So the you know, I, I think the original question we were asking was, yeah, what is it it's really clear what, what you do if you're representing a file. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like a bunch of bytes, they're all in a row. Um, it's and so it's clear how to make a distributed file system. You just do that bigger on more computers, but it, it wasn't super clear to us what um, what you do if you're representing a stream. And I think most people who have thought about that problem really think of it as something very transient. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we had gone down that path at, as part of these kind of ad hoc data pipelines. I was trying to build out these very transient, you know, message delivery things. It was it was extremely hard to build anything that worked around it. And so. We had kind of thought about this more, and we thought about what happened in data systems, and we looked at other kind of um, like architectures around search and how do people do search well. And we really came up with this kind of log concept, which mm -hmm. I can probably draw out. You know, you you really have some kind of structured, almost commit log, where you have a series of records, like, and new records are getting appended. This is a new. This is old. And you know, time is basically going that way. And in some sense, this is the first thing that happened, and this is the end thing that happened. You can give each of these a number, and um, then you can imagine, you know, people who are uh, processing this data that happened in time, they're kind of just reading from left to right, uh -huh. and so each. Each thing that wants to subscribe to the stream, they can do that at their own pace. They can do it fast, they can do it in slow, they can do it in batch, they can do it in real time. Um, and they kind of maintain some, you know, if this is a reader, they maintain some pointer as to where they're at in, uh, in this, you know, sequence of things that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so this was the kind of core idea of this log concept. So there's obviously a log in almost like a database internal sense, not like a log file sense, which is very confusing because sometimes mm -hmm. people put logs in the log file sense into Kafka. Um, but this was the core idea, and um, you know, all Kafka does is basically you know, make each of these a partition and allow you to spread them over a cluster and then allow you to manage a cluster and have different kind of named topics. So mm -hmm. you could have a topic that was the page views for your website and it would be something, you know, a set of these logs and maybe it would be partitioned by the user or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, and um, it's in different readers, uh, partitioned by the user or? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so you, you know, the 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 writer gets to choose how the data is split up over these logs, and the ordering is really within one of these. And so you could think of it. Um, so, if I were to draw out that picture completely, you know, maybe there would be another one of these <laughs> same logs down here, and maybe this would be partition zero and partition one. Mm -hmm. And the writer and, defines the partition. Yeah, that's right. And mm -hmm. so, um, so when you write, you're basically choosing what this is. Mm -hmm. ordered by. Mm -hmm. Is it ordered by user? Is it ordered by whatever? And th this seems odd, but it actually makes some amount of sense in that if you think about how computers work, they have processes which are usually strongly ordered, or threads which are strongly ordered in time and what they do, but there's lots of them spread over machines, so so you really have you know a set of things which have a strong ordering, mm -hmm. um, and no concrete ordering between two threads on different machines. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could order them by some timestamp, but it's very loose. Mm -hmm. um, and so this tends to match that kind of, you know, this model matches kind of what's happening in the world in that mm -hmm. respect, and so it matches um, writes to a you know centralized relational database. It tends to match writes to a distributed database, which usually has its own partition concept. Right. It tends to match you know activities by users, which are spread over a bunch of machines, um, and you can map a lot of things to this, and so it, it's relatively flexible. How do you guys maintain consistency in the data? Mm -hmm. How do you make sure I'm writing into this pipe, it's actually coming on the other side? Yeah, totally. So this is one of the things we uh, spent a lot of time on um, that um, other, you know, I think other log things didn't. So the first thing we did was we just implemented this as a, 
you know, with no replication or, or really uh, fault tolerance mm -hmm. over machines. And that was good enough for kind of a log data pipeline. And this is what was kind of comparable to Scribe or other mm -hmm. things that were out there. But our goal was always to be able to handle all different types of data, including very important things. And, um, you know, I'd come out of a, a kind of database background working on databases. Uh, Gene Rao, who was one of the other guys working on this, had, you know, previously worked on Cassandra and this kind of Paxos data store. And so we had a pretty good background in kind of consensus algorithms and, you know, how do you how do you get a bunch of computers to agree on the ordering of things, which is right. kind of the core problem. And so when so we had actually relatively early on a design for how to do um, replication properly. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean, you know, if you if you imagine this abstract data structure, how can you replicate that over, say, three machines, make them agree exactly on the order? Um, at any given time, of course, some of them will have written some stuff, the others haven't, and you have to know exactly what you're guaranteed to have in any kind of failure case. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is exactly the problem any of these consensus algorithms solve. Mm -hmm. well, the only easy. difference here is um, you need to do many of these uh, logs instead of one. Mm -hmm. so, so these have gotten uh, actually much more popular among distributed systems. People are better known. Typically people know about Paxos, mm -hmm. um, but Raft is mm -hmm. another thing in that category. They're typically aimed at maintaining one log. And so all we're trying to do is basically extend that concept to maintaining many logs mm -hmm. and efficiently failing over leadership and that kind of stuff and making uh, redundancy um, good. So all of them have a, a really simple property, which is the, um, you know, whatever you tell the user. So if you write to, if you write to my system, I can't tell you I have that right unless I can guarantee that even if I die, None of the other, you know, all mm -hmm. the other machines will have it. Right. They take over. Kind and of so an HDFS approach to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, HDFS is a little fast and loose about this. So, so it's actually, you know, kind of a very formal property, and it has to do with how you choose who's in charge mm -hmm. and how you tell the writer that the write has happened. And mm -hmm. those two things have to kind of balance in a way that I never tell you if I can't, if I, if, if you know, the the person I choose to be in charge won't have it. And that's the property you try and prove about Raft or Paxos or mm -hmm. any of these things to to prove that you know if I tell you you got it, it must be the case that. In any kind of sequence of failures, the the resulting leader has that data, mm -hmm. um, and the flip side is actually not guaranteed. Which is, if I can't acknowledge the right, then you don't know. You have to mm -hmm. you have to try again. Mm -hmm. And so, is there a way using Zookeeper then to keep all call things around, or is it more for? Yeah. So the way Kafka works is it has to, um, you know, it it, um, it has to maintain these type of logs over thousands of these over mm -hmm. a, a cluster. And so what it does is it. Um, it's a little bit if you're if you're familiar with consensus algorithms the um, it's a little bit like how yeah 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 so what you know the way we use zookeeper is we basically use it as a kind of bootstrapping consensus so mm -hmm. we we have to um, effectively elect leaders for thousands of partitions mm -hmm. so rather than doing a thousand zookeeper based elections or a thousand mm -hmm. elections using some other algorithm, we effectively elect a controller who mm -hmm. makes all the decisions and kind of broadcasts them. Mm -hmm. And when that fails, we elect a new one mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and this idea is very old. So um, I think there's something called, maybe it's cheap Paxos or mm -hmm. something, it's very old. It's basically mm -hmm. a very similar idea where you have mm -hmm. you know, some kind of consensus implementation and you use that to basically bootstrap um, effectively cheap consensus mm -hmm. across other replicas. And it gets you two things in Kafka. One, you don't have to have five copies of your data to mm -hmm. handle uh, two failures. And two, the process of electing replicas, you know, electing leaders is actually much cheaper. Yeah. Um, so, so Kafka uses Zookeeper for a couple things. It uses it for all the metadata. It uses it for maintaining who's, um, you know, the leader, meaning the person ordering rights for each partition. And it, it also uses it for maintaining information about who's consuming what mm -hmm. um, and electing the the Kafka node responsible for each group of consumers. Do you feel Zookeeper is um, enough appreciated in the community? I think there's only really two I, big projects, you guys and maybe Mesos, that hardcore rely on, on Zookeeper. Um, you know, I think, I think people uh, respect that it works or what it does. I think um, people tend to not like it mm -hmm. uh, for maybe a variety of reasons, I don't know. Um, from my point of view, I think you know maybe maybe one thing we've learned as like a system building community is that that kind of consensus implementation um, 
is it best as a separate shared service? But mm -hmm. it's actually an implementation detail yeah. of these systems. I, I actually don't see things going in that direction. I, you know, I see instead there's a bunch of like etcd and other Zookeeper-like things. Mm -hmm. um, to me, they don't improve that much. Mm -hmm. Like they're pretty similar to Zookeeper. Yeah, um, they're newer, but they basically do the same yeah. stuff. And I'm I'm always well. Um, obviously, uh, the name node came long before the Zookeeper, but I, I you know. I, I just wish to, everybody would come together and just build one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, kind of the Google Borg thing, where like yeah, everybody's yeah. like, "Oh, this is rock solid, and it just solves yep, all of our yep, problems." Yep. Yeah, and I, I think Zookeeper is in a reasonably good shape. Like, it's um, you know, we've we've definitely hit bugs, but not a lot of them. 